Hello, my name is Marek Skulimowski. I'm the president and executive director of the Kościuszko Foundation. Uh, welcome to the Kościuszko Foundation webinar series. Today we'll present a lecture and webinar by Kristina Piurkowska titled 70 Years of the Madden Committee Report, Reflections on the U.S. House Committee to Investigate the Karin Massacre. Kristina Piurkowska is as more and more members of the Polish diaspora are bilingual and almost bicultural. She has lived in New York City for over 90% of her life and has a BA from the City College of New York and a Master of Fine Arts degree from Columbia University and was a Kościuszko Foundation Fellowship awardee. Her parents, both government employees, were taken prisoner by the Soviet NKVD and her mother, Eugenia Drongis, was accused of and sentenced for treason and sent to the Timnikovsky Gulag near Potma, Moldova, while her father, Jerzy Jan Piurkowski, as a reserve officer, was held in various camps, Kalvaria, Kozielsk II, Pavlishev Bor, and Gryazowiec. They joined the Polish army during its initial formation and their IDs were numbered 365 and 442. In a sense, both her experience and a KF fellow and her parents' experience brought her to a point when she describes, this, uh, describes it in a third quarter of her life, she worked on translations and other material, materials for Professor Janusz Cisek, then director of the Polish Army Museum in Warsaw. It was he who asked her in the spring of 2009 to prepare an English language brochure on, as he descri described it, the American officers who went to Katyn to view the exhumations. It was his hope that Americans who visited the, the Katyn uh, site could thus read and learn about Katyn. When she returned to Warsaw after three months, she announced, we have a problem. The witnesses were neither all Americans nor the all officers, nor in fact, they were all military. And lastly, they did go to Katyn of the own volition, but were taken there under duress as prisoners of the Germans. What then would, would you like me to do? The answer was to continue the research. Three years of work culminated in the publication of English speaking witnesses to cutting recent research published as a Theta Batch edition. Since the publication of her book, she continued her research, discovering more interesting materials, and I hope Ms. Piorkowska will be able to tell us more about, about them during this lecture. She's currently waiting for the disclassification of the Madden Committee-related materials, as well as, as well as materials on the William Tonesk, another KF grantee, born as Władysław Jan Toniecki, who worked for the CIA. And she is planning to visit the Hoover archives as well as the Fur Furcuolo and Madden archives. Ms. Piorkowska, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, before I start uh, the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation, I'd just like to say it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride because, as Marek Sklimowski said, most people don't really have all the facts about what the Katyn massacre is. And so I'm going to try to introduce you to it. So bear with me, you're going to be looking at a screen and you'll be hearing my voice and it won't always be the same. There may be different uh, aspects on screen differing somewhat from what I'm giving you verbally, but it will all coalesce. And of course you can return later when the webinar is up on the KF channel and you'll be able to look at it and learn some more. The Katyn massacre serves as a fulcrum on which the Soviet Union's and now Russia's relationship with Poland and at certain times that of the West had between 1942 and 2010 teetered. The massacre of some 24,000 individuals in 1940 
at various locations throughout the various Soviet republics, some in Western Russia, some in Belarus and Ukraine became a catchword for Poles in the homeland and in the di diaspora. What is important to remember is that the victims of the Katyn massacre included Polish citizens of all ethnic groups and all religions residing in Poland. There were individuals who were the first in their families to have finished gymnasium and others who were descendants of wealthy families. There, were, there was the chief rabbi of the Polish army as well as Roman Catholic priests and Protestant ministers. Their crime, their only crime was being Polish and being opposed to what the Soviet Union was doing. However, the Katyn massacre remains an enigma to most Westerners, including those of the allied nations whose armies were allied with Poland during the war. For 90% of them, the fact that the USSR was in fact allied with Germany is still difficult to comprehend, if not totally unknown. Thus, the concept that the Soviets could have murdered allied POWs was not conceivable, although the last year has probably taught them a lot. What I hope to do in this presentation is to present a summary of what the Katyn massacre was, what some of the ways in which information was transferred to the Western powers uh, occurred as early as the spring of 1943, and how the massacre was treated during the Nuremberg tribunals, as well as the Nuremberg trials, with reference to the 1948 seventh and eighth counterintelligence corps investigations of the massacre. We will then speak about what happened in 1949, referring to the Herald Tribune articles written by Julius Epstein, as well as the activities of Arthur Bliss Lane, who created a private committee to investigate the Katyn massacre. Afterwards, we will move on to know what we discuss, what we know about the creation of the Madden Committee and its engagement with the Polish diaspora, primarily in London. And we'll touch on the issue of what hurdles, if any, were encountered by the Madden Committee in its work. The Madden Committee, despite its failings, serves as a marker on the road to justice for all POWs and vic other victims of war. It was the first time that the US House of Representatives had voted to create an investigative body to study the causes and manner of death of foreign POWs on foreign soil, with the additional caveat that it had no access to the physical murder sites and could not interview the perpetrators. It also could not do more than indicate the presumed guilty nation and request that the Department of State move to the United Nations and request that the United Nations act on this matter. Yet during World War II, there was a large number of individuals, both in the diplomatic services of the various governments, as well as military intelligence and military liaison officers working with the Polish army in the Middle East, who were well aware of what had happened. They were, there were, of course, good working relationships and friendships that had developed between Polish officers and their counterparts in the US and British armies. Furthermore, there were other ways in which information about the Katyn massacre uh, was agglomerated by the various intelligence services, both during and after the war. What is the Katyn massacre? As I said, it's the massacre, the extrajudicial execution of 24,000 individuals who had been taken prisoner in an undeclared war. The Soviet Union had signed the Ribbentrop-Molotov Agreement just prior to the September 1st. And in addition to agreeing to supply Germany with raw materials such as grain and petroleum products, it immeasurably aided the Germans in their ability to move rapidly forward in Western Europe because the Soviet Union took care, quote unquote, of the Eastern Front. However, the agreement also aided Germany uh, in that their, the borders splitting Poland were clearly defined in that protocol. 
a large number of Polish troops together with their commanding officers were repositioned to the East in the early weeks of the war prior to the invasion uh, by the Soviets. And they were captured by the Soviet army and placed into internment camps. These were the prisoners of an undeclared war and so doubly unprotected since the USSR had refused to acknowledge the treaties signed earlier by the Tsarist government. And thus there was no protection from the Hague Convention as it related to prisoner of wars. To add to the difficulties, there was no set procedures as to how and where they should be imprisoned. And they were transferred to the NKVD Soviet secret police, which operated various camps in what had previously been monasteries. Some camps were in Western Russia, some were in Ukraine, and at least one was located in Lithuania. In the first months of the war, the Russians released, the Soviets released the rank and file soldiers and allowed them to return home. The men who remained were officers, both career and reserve, as well as junior officers. And the number of prisoners was reduced. Various camps were reutilized. One of these camps located as most of the others were in a former monastery was in Putivil, near Sumy, Ukraine which figured in the information gathered, and this is a map showing where Putivo uh, is located. It's literally right on the border with almost Russia proper, um, where uh, it figures into the ex a visit of the English speaking witnesses to Katyn, who are taken to the massacre site under duress on May 13th, 1943. This camp was a site unknown to any of the Western allies and its existence as a transit camp was only confirmed in documents released during Glasnost and listed in Katyn, a crime without punishment. There were also camps in Ostashku, Starobielsk, and those prisoners were killed in Mednoye, Bikovnia, and Tver. The men in those groups were policemen, forest rangers, prison guards, and similar uniformed services. The common factor was a higher level of education than in the average population and experience using firearms and work in a structured organization. As the first six months of the war concluded and the war with Finland, which was concurrently going on was not going well, Stalin and the rest of the Politburo decided that they would eliminate the entrenched bourgeois enemies of the Soviet states. During those months, various individuals in the NKVD had questioned the officers and attempted to determine which men, if any, would agree to collaborate. One of the men who was known to have interrogated the men in held in Kozhelsk was named Zarubin. He was multilingual and well-educated and conversed with these officers on various subjects, including literature. Interestingly, Zarubin was later assigned to serve as station head of the NKVD illegals working in the United States. And he was serving there in the spring of 1943 when the announcement of the discovery of the bodies in cutting was made. He panicked and sent a coded cable to Moscow discussing his concerns about being identified. In this cable, he committed a basic error of spycraft in that he mentioned the very name of Kozhevsk, and this entire cable came to light as the Venona papers were decoded and later declassified. There was only a minimal number of men who agreed to collaborate, and so this convinced the NKVD that they were dealing with a hardened band of anti-communists, and with the war going as it did in Finland, uh, they made the decision, that is Stalin and the Politburo, to as quickly as possible eliminate these men. The documents were signed in late February 1940, and the executions took place in April and May. The men from Kozhevsk were taken to Kati, Kozheguri, and it was that site that was the first to, quote, be discovered. The term discovered needs to be used carefully since there is evidence that the Germans may have known of the massacre and the general location of at least this site from early in the war. However, it was Kati, and Kati only, that lay in an area which was far enough west 
to allow for reasonably unhindered work. Thus, the German announcement of April 13th, 1943 of the discovery of 10,000 graves, because by then they knew that the Poles had been reporting that 10,000 men were missing, led to massive news reporting by media throughout the United States, Great Britain, and German-occupied Europe. Clearly, the Germans wanted to exploit the news to their political benefit, while the US and Great Britain wanted to minimize the damage that such news could do to British, US, and USSR alliance. In fact, the German underground wanted to use this information as bait for the US and Britain to cancel their alliance with the Soviets, and there were several approaches made to US and British representatives in both Spain and Turkey. In Spain, it was Wild Bill Donovan from the OSS, and in Turkey, it was George Earl, about whom you will hear later. The US government was concerned about how war information could impact on the ethnic populations in the US and thus instituted special censorship in the Office of War Information, and this specifically related to any materials which were to be presented on Kati. FDR did not want the alliance with the Soviets to be threatened because it, for him, it was easier to fight a war in which the USSR was bearing the brunt of the counteroffensive with the Germans, while the US and the British were fighting the Japanese in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, as well as the smaller field of battle in North Africa. Were the alliance with the Soviets to be threatened or dissolved, and given the fact that the Soviets still had a mutual assistance pact with the Japanese, there was no telling what could occur. FDR was conscious that particularly in the early part of the war, many Americans were still isolationists and did not want their boys dying in a foreign war. The Germans separately brought in various groups to view the exhumation sites. These included Polish journalists, Western European journalists. There were, throughout this period, there were groups of the Wehrmacht, the Division Azul, Portuguese and Spanish soldiers, and French Foreign Legion, the, French, the Charlemagne Division, visiting the site. The International Medical Commission, formed when the International Committee of the Red Cross refused to investigate, came in the last days of April. Later, a group of Polish POWs was brought in. And the final group was that of the English speaking witnesses to cutting. The general estimate is that between all of the aforementioned groups, there were some 240,000 individuals who came to cutting. Uh, given recent research, we know quite a bit more about the visit of the English speaking witnesses than that of the Polish POWs who apparently did not file protests with the puissance protectrice, i.e. the Swiss, who represented the interests of the US and Great Britain and presumably Poland, while the Brits and Americans did. Thus, we know that it was the senior British officer, the senior American officer, and the senior civilian internee held in captivity who were to lead the delegation. We know that the US State Department wrote back to the puissance and asked them to ascertain certain information. And they, they, this did not include the conclusions and they did contact the US officers. The British have not ever released the records of what happened with the puissance protectrice. We know that the Germans gave the prisoners written orders to participate and that the CA, SAO and the SBO submitted letters of protest to the German camp commander, commanders and the senior British officers who actually traveled were not the ones originally expected to travel. In short, the officers who went were not the very senior officers and this part of the German plan had collapsed. It is important to remember that the entire process of communication did go through the senior officers in the camp. And this was Auflag 9A, excuse me, Auflag 9A slash Z in Rottenburg. And uh, that was where the Americans who went were located at that moment. In the case of the Americans, the senior officer was Lieutenant Colonel John H. Van Vliet Jr. The question arises, given that the correspondence to the Puissance Protectrice took months to reach 
the appropriate authorities. Did the US or British authorities know what was happening concurrently to the event? The answer is yes. There exists a memorandum issued by MI9, the British intelligence unit uh, dealing with war prisoners, prisoners of war, and sent to var various British entities as well as US military intelligence and dated the last day of April, 1943, in which they confirmed that the group was in Berlin en route to Katyn. There were only two places the information could come from, and the probable source was a short burst radio located in Offlock 9AZ. It is appropriate to add several comments about the knowledge of the British and Americans about Katyn and the planned visit of the International Medical Commission, or IMC, whose members came from various nations in Europe, both occupied like Switzerland, like uh, both occupied and like Switzerland neutral. One of the individuals who never made it to Katyn was Dr. Piga of Spain, who arrived in Berlin and, and almost immediately turned back. He had visited the embassy. When the Madden Committee was planning their European visit in 1952, members of the US consulate went to meet with Dr. Piga to clarify and perhaps determine if he would want to testify. He was actually surprised that they were not aware of what had occurred in Madrid nine years earlier. Either the consular records had been disinfected or the current staff did not bother to check. Despite the fact that the IMC was formed very quickly, the US government was well aware of who was going to be present. In the case of Dr. Piga, the local US officials approached the prime minister of Spain and one of the senior generals and quote unquote, discussed the return of Dr. Piga to Madrid. And that is precisely what happened after his visit to the embassy. One of the other individuals of the IMC was Dr. Helge Tramsen, concurrently a member of the Danish underground. A different individual had been designated to represent Denmark, but presumably under British pre pressure, that individual declared that due to illness, he would not be able to travel. It is generally reported that Thompson requested and received permission from the underground to travel. I posit a different theory. The British were desperate to receive information from operatives, be they German or Polish, on how to bomb the Ruhr Valley dams. They had failed spectacularly in their efforts to destroy the dams, which provided electrical energy needed for the German war industry. When Tramsen left Germany, he brought one of the cutting skulls with him, and as did each of the members of the IMC. However, under the skull, he had placed two reports. One was written by a young Wehrmacht physician who had been assigned to prepare this by the German young Junkers, the non-Nazi Wehrmacht members. And the other item was a report on the specific angles at which bombers were to drop their cargo over the dams to achieve the desired effect. Two external facts confirmed that the bombing instructions arrived in London. One is a memorandum issued by MI9, while the second is the fact that the dams were bombed on May 16th, 17th, 1943, a bit over a week after Dr. Thompson's return from Berlin. It is improbable to believe that having undertaken the effort he did, that Thompson did not forward both reports to Great Britain. Originally, the plan was for 12 men to visit Cutting with seven rank and file men, four officers, and one civilian internee. However, when the Germans discovered or determined that all of the men refused to acquiesce and agree not to escape, and the senior officer, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Stevenson from South Africa, refused to sign a parole, four of the men were sent back to their soldag. They were replaced by four guards. The journey required two landings for refueling and flew over Warsaw where they saw the ghetto burning. Captain Stan, Dr. Stanley S. Gilder of the British Territorials was the only man in the group who spoke German and a bit of Russian. It was he as a physician who was delegated to discuss the autopsies with Dr. Boots, 
the local German representative. And as he spoke Russian, it was he who spoke to the Russian peasants. Because the Germans thought he had tuberculosis, he was released on compassionate leave in November 1944. Therefore, his report was the first multi-page description of the visit presented to British and Americans. And on this photo, you can see all of the men. Uh, Dr. Gilder is in the middle to, if you look at him, almost dead center in the glasses. Van Vliet is standing with his back to us. Uh, Frank Stevenson is standing to the right of Dr. Gilder. And uh, the man in the suit is Frank Struben, the civilian internee from Guernsey. The group was very careful not to exhibit any emotions during the site visit, nor did they discuss their opinions either there in the quarters they were assigned to in Cutting or upon their return to Berlin in the Arbeits, Arbeits House. The only time they felt comfortable speaking was when they went on escorted walks in the Tiergarten, when two of them could fall back and exchange some thoughts. They were correct in their assumption that the cutting site was equipped with microphones and cameras in the trees. Stevenson was sent to a camp in Northern Italy and the rank and file as well as the civilian were returned to their camps. The group in Berlin was reduced to three men. The group had spent about 24 hours in cutting, and in addition to selecting a specific corpse for autopsy and viewing it, Van Vliet visited the repository of documents and materials that the Germans had removed from the corpses. It was the information about one victim that Van Vliet recorded and then included in the sworn deposition which he submitted to the US JAG representative in Paris on May 10th, 1945. This was the first and only time that any English language material included mention of the transit camp in Putivo. When Van Vliet and Captain Stewart were returned to Oflag 9 and Z, the Americans were being transited to Shubin and occupied Poland. However, the British had planned an escape and the decision was made to allow Van Vliet to join the group. He faked a leg, leg injury and was not transported out. Unfortunately, the Germans learned of the escape and so Van Vliet was sent to Oflag 64. Each camp was organized with a formal command structure, senior command, a senior American officer, his deputy and so on. However, there existed a second secret structure which oversaw all matters in the camp. And this was parallel in British and in US camps. Thus, the senior officer could meet with the camp commandant and truthfully state that he was not aware of any escape plans or other projects, because he wasn't. Van Vliet was in charge of the escape committee in Oflag 64. However, both he and Stuart were registered code users, which meant that they could send messages in their regular correspondence home. And as they were, they were known, their letters would be pulled from any mail deliveries and transferred over to PO Box 1142, which was G2. And those letters were then photocopied so they could be deciphered. Van Vliet and on his instruction, Stuart responded to questions about the Katyn massacre. One of these letters was sent after the Soviet Burdenko Commission report, which blamed the Germans in January of 1944. In one of these letters, Van Vliet also requested permission for the evacuation of the entire off-flock. He did this in the early spring of 1944, however, and as they were located in Europe, it was the British who had to approve the evacuation. There was a massive delay in reviewing the request and by the time it was reviewed, it was May. And Operation D-Day was the entire focus. Operation Overlord was the entire focus. And no one was willing to allocate any planes for the project. Very simply, Van Vliet was concerned that the Soviet army would occupy Oflog 64 and the POWs would be at risk of the same fate as the Polish officers had been. And while he and Stuart would be specifically targeted for execution, both Van Vliet and Stuart had copies of photos of Katyn. You just saw two of the photos from Smolensk, which all of them had received, um, and of the cathedral. 
uh, in Smolensk. And uh, Van Vliet had specific notes he had taken on the subject. As the Germans marched the POWs out of Shubin and headed up to Ustam or Shvina Uistje, they decided to split the group in two. The first group consisted of healthy men who were marched into Germany, while the second group of 100 men consisted of the ill and infirm. Van Vliet had himself assigned to that group, which traveled via open rail cargo train. Bob Temstra, a Dutchman who had been an interpreter for the US Army, but who had, when he was captured, stated that he was an American and had created some ID number that was confirmed by all the Americans as being real, uh, was assigned to help him. They literally served as nurses for the ill, many of whom had frostbite and diarrhea. But Van Vliet's goal was achieved. He and Stuart were separated, which lessened the probability that both groups would be strafed and the cutting information would be destroyed. Luckenwald in Germany, which is where the Van Vliet group was now held, was deserted by the Germans on April 24th, 1945. The Soviet army marched past the camp, but would soon bring in people who would institute their uh, regime. The following month would be one of risk, transit, and reporting. Van Vliet received permission from a senior officer to escape Luckenwald and headed to Dubin, from whence he was taken to General Lightning Joe Collins, who sent him on to Paris Shape headquarters. Lightning Joe had known Van Vliet since he was in diapers, so their ability to communicate rapidly was much more uh, easier than any other officer who would have walked in. It was there in Paris, in Shape headquarters, that on May 10th, 1945, Van Vliet was questioned by a JAG war crimes officer whose surname was Hoffman, and the sworn deposition was prepared in four copies one for Shafe headquarters, one for JAG war crimes, and two copies for Van Vliet to bring back to the US. This deposition disappeared for almost 70 years until I discovered it in NARA in 2013, at the National Archives, of course, NARA. By about May 20th, uh, and Shafe a Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. My apologies for using shortcuts. By about May 20th, Van Vliet was in Washington and waiting to speak with General Bissell, the head of G2 or military intelligence. By May 23rd, Van Vliet had dictated a multi-page report which then disappeared. When in 1950, Montgomery Green, one of the individuals who was working with Ambassador Bliss Lane uh, was attempting to locate information about the massacre, con contacted Van Vliet, a problem arose. The report was reported as missing. This led to the conclusion by various individuals over the years that General Bissell had destroyed the report. The fact is that the US government, the US Supreme Court, Judge Jackson, who was US prosecutor in Nuremberg was a member of the court, and the US military would all be terribly embarrassed if it became public that a sworn deposition for the war crimes unit had been disregarded by JAG, had not been presented in Nuremberg, and that the US had been well aware of who had done what in Kati. Of course, I do not possess documentary evidence that the sworn deposition had been attached to the report. However, it is highly improbable that Van Vliet would have brought back two copies of the deposition and the photographs and his notes and not enclosed it with the report he signed and submitted in the offices of G2. There is no credible reason in 1950 why General Bissell would have destroyed the report, nor these 72 years later has there been any information located which would confirm that he did destroy the report. In fact, General Bissell served as military attaché in London, where in 1947, the Polish emigre government awarded him the Polonia Restituta. Even after the Madden Committee hearings and after the allegations, there was never an attempt to revoke that award. To return to the Nuremberg trials and tribunal, 
What is more interesting than the Soviet attempt to charge the Germans during the tribunal of 46 is the fact that prior to the Soviet charges being submitted in open court, Wild Bill Donovan, head of the OSS, which served as the research arm for the US prosecutor's office, had prepared a report including the opinions of two experienced German anti-Nazis that any, which stated that any attempt to charge the Germans with the Katyn massacre was bound to end in a debacle. This is of course, precisely what happened. The question is how much of this information was made available to the rest of the British, French, or US prosecutorial teams by Justice Robert Jackson, who was the addressee of Wild Bill Donovan's memo. What is of interest to those individuals attempting to study the Madden Committee is that Justice Jackson never mentioned the Donovan materials in his testimony to the committee. In fact, there is a second document that Justice Jackson failed to mention in his testimony, despite the fact that it is part of the personal papers in the LOC. I refer to the memorandum sent to him by General Clay, commandant of the American sector in Germany. And he refers to his source, our people in Warsaw. I believe that that source was William Tonietzsk, the Kosciuszko Foundation Fellowship awardee of the mid 1930s, who was serving as Naval Attaché and was an OSS officer working in Warsaw, Poland. And um, later in 1948, upon orders issued in Frankfurt, the US Army 7th and 8th Counter Counterintelligence Corps in Austria investigated the Katyn massacre and collected over 100 pages of testimony, including a statement from an individual who was hospitalized with Stevenson, as well as interviews with Lieutenant Slovenchik's widow. Again, were all the specifics of the information collected made available to US prosecutors? Or since the documents confirmed that the Germans could not reasonably be charged, was a decision made not to present these records to the prosecutors? I will add that these documents, most of the ones that I'm referring to right now, uh, were declassified under President Obama in 2012, uh, while the British have failed uh, to declassify most of the documents that they still possess. How much of this information was available to the Bliss Lane created American Community Committee for the investigation of the Katyn massacre is not clear. However, an analysis of the personal papers of the ambassador held at Yale University does not reveal any copies of the aforementioned correspondence or other materials which have been located since 2009. What is clear is that Julius Epstein, a Viennese journalist who was in the US by the late 1930s, and Bliss Lane created a formidable, formidable attack unit. It was Epstein who wrote the article which appeared on the front page of the New York Tribune on July 3rd and 4th, 1949, and which brought the Katyn massacre to the forefront of American minds. It was as a result of that article that Epstein received a letter informing him of the names of the three of the officers who were taken to Katyn. It is important to note that the only scholarly article on Bliss Lane, which appeared in the Polish Review several decades ago, is totally contemptuous of him and at best describes him as a rabid but alcoholic anti-communist. Conversely, a full-length biography of him barely mentions his involvement with the Katyn Massacre Committee and does not mention his vigorous engagement with aiding and planning for the witnesses who were to plan in front of the, uh, were to appear in front of the Madden Committee. This fact is surprising since the author was a friend of Bliss Lane's. Bliss Lane was also friends with Lev Sapieha and through him had contacts with the Polish political and military diaspora in Britain. And he made two lengthy trips at the start of 51 and 50, not only to London, but to Italy and elsewhere on the continent. It was Bliss Lane who laid the groundwork for developing the contacts with, among others, the forensic scientists who were members of the IMC. It is unclear from the Bliss Lane papers whether it was he who laid out the list of contacts he needed to meet with 
or how many there were, or whether it was individuals in the Polish diaspora who laid out the path he needed to follow. What is clear is that Bliss Lane was one of the principal sources for the Madden Committee and his contacts through his prior work as ambassador to Poland and the friendship he developed with Stanisław Mikołajczyk. In fact, it was he and others who funded the funeral for Mikołajczyk's wife and others in the London diaspora that contributed enormously to the hearings of the Madden Committee. How much is not clear from the personal papers. The plans for creation of what became known as the Madden Committee crystallized over the summer of 1951. As we have been able to observe over recent decades, the formation of a special committee requires a number of steps. Among them, the passage of a resolution which must be passed by the appropriate chamber and then the committee must be formed. To be precise, the Polish use of the term komisja is incorrect. The, the term is committee or komitet. A komisja or commission has totally different rights and responsibilities in the United States, and it is confusing and misleading for the Polish student or reader who wishes to understand the subject. The Madden Committee was not a commission because in a commission, you also have membership that can consist of individuals who are not members of either the House or the Senate. So on September 18th, the resolution was passed, resolution number 390, and the speaker announced the appointment of representatives Madden, Flood, Machrowicz, Furkolo, Dondero, Okoinski, and Sheehan to comprise a select committee to conduct an investigation and study of the Cutting Forest Massacre of thousands of Polish officers. The error that is committed in Poland in referring to this as a komisja is the first error. The second error is that they refer to the entirety of the materials produced by the Madden Committee as being the report. They are not the report. The report consists of seven volumes. I'm sorry. The hearings consist of seven volumes and the report is one volume. There was an interim report issued in the summer in July of 52. And the final report was issued right before Christmas uh, pause in December of 52. So uh, the resolution was passed in the early fall, almost immediately upon return to Congress. This was necessary since David Stewart of the US Army, who had been one of the English speaking witnesses was due to be shipped out of the United States. It is therefore clear that there had been anticipatory contacts with the army and or Stuart concerning his availability. Therefore, it was purely a fluke of orders, postings and budgetary issues, which made, made then Colonel Donald B. Stewart the first and only witness on November 10th, 1951. Stewart's testimony, though concrete and compelling was that of a junior officer. He was not the person who could testify about the letters of the German commandant of Auflag 9 or the response of the commandant or the letter sent to the puissance or the response from the State Department. As a junior officer, he had only graduated from West Point in 1940. He was not the recipient of or author of any correspondence in the matter of copying. Volume one of the Madden Committee testimony consists solely of his testimony. Volume two of the testimony, those hearings also took place in Washington on February 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th of 1952 and heard from seven witnesses. There were two witnesses from Canada, one of whom was the former Polish ambassador to Russia, Tadeusz Romer. Surprisingly, a Roman Catholic priest, Father Marie Leopold Brown, an assumptionist also appeared. He was the only Roman Catholic priest in the Russian Federation during the entire war. His testimony was needed to supplement that of the journalist, Henry Cassidy of the Associated Press. 
I say needed because the journalist who was actually scheduled to testify about the visit of the Western journalists in January of 44 to the Burdenko investigation at the Katyn massacre site uh, had died. That was Edward Angley, and he died on December 7th, 1951. So the committee had to quickly determine which of the journalists who had participated in that event was willing to testify and was located in the United States. Harrison Salisbury of the UP and the New York, later the New York Times, avoided publicizing the fact that he had posted on the Katyn massacre until 44 years after the Burdenko Commission. The first witness on February 4th was Colonel John Van Vliet. His testimony must have been very difficult for him as he had to conceal the fact that he had authored and or authorized coded letters which were sent from Oflak 64 to military intelligence. He had to conceal the fact that he had submitted a sworn deposition to the war crimes unit. When I listened to the tape recording of Janusz Zawodny's interview with Van Vliet recorded in Omaha, on December 5th, 1988, there was a moment when the recording was stopped and restarted. Van Vliet had broken down. Van Vliet, when Van Vliet spoke about the photographs that he had managed to retain together with his notes all through 1943-44 and had concealed during the march from Schubin to Luckenwald and had escaped to the American side, he never mentioned what had happened to them. They had, of course, been attached to the May 23rd report, the one which contained, uh, uh, the one to which he had a cop, uh, attached a copy of the sworn deposition. Not a word of this passed his lips, not to the Madden Committee, not to Professor Zavodny, and certainly not in the oral history recording which he made at the very end of his life. What is clear also is that John Mitchell, the legal counsel for the Madden Committee, was meeting during, with the CIA during this entire time period to discover various aspects and issues on a regular basis. He called them, he wrote to them, he met with them. In some cases, he shared information with them. In some cases, he politely asked for information. In other cases, he knew the precise file number he wanted, or he wanted to interview individuals who were still CIA agents either in open or executive hearings. Although these materials have been sanitized in CIA parlance, it refers to removing any identifying data. At least in one document, it appears to re refer to Lieutenant Tonyets, the Naval Attaché in Moscow in 1943, later serving the same function in Poland. Tonyets was also assigned to Cairo prior to Moscow, where he liaisoned with the Polish military intelligence services, which clearly means that the OSS must have had reports from him concerning cutting as well. These uh, men whom he met in Cairo were the ones who were closest to the Polish army investigation of the Katyn massacre. Uh, there was also Colonel Henry Szymański, who worked in Cairo at a later time. And he prepared a report on the orders of General Strong, which went to Mar General Marshall. Now, there is a third possibility that Szymański was the actual author of the report discussed in the Le Madden Committee testimony but a second report was submitted by Lieutenant Tonyets, who had by 1952 left the CIA and might have wanted to disclose what information he had collected over the prior 10 years on the Katyn massacre. Suffice it to say that Tonyets never testified to the Madden Committee in public hearings, nor did any report attributable to him ever appear in their records or was it referenced. Volume three of the testimony consists of hearings held in Chicago with eight witnesses of whom one traveled from Canada. The most significant testimony that day came from Colonel Szymański, whom I had just mentioned, and Dr. Miloslavich, 
Dr. Miloslavich, of whom it is variously written that he escaped to the US in 1954 or that he hid in Austria until 1948, was a US born citizen. He was uh, one of the people whose parents had done a reverse migration and returned to Croatia. Uh, he left Croatia in 1944, crossed into Austria, where he worked in a US Army lab in Salzburg until his paperwork to return to the US was processed. It is worth noting here that during this testimony, there were several individuals who resided in Canada and therefore needed visas to enter the US. It was the responsibility of Roman Puczynski, the son of a Chicago radio personality to handle such matters. To be blunt, the functions which Puczynski was responsible for was interpreting for non-English speakers and serving as a gopher. Recently, Recently, the Polish government funded a project to document the lives of Lydia Puczynska and Roman Puczynski, her son. When questioned directly, two of the people involved in the project, James Pula and Dominic Patsiga, had to admit that they could not document any record of Puczynski actually serving as an investigator for the Madden Committee. He was titled that way, it helped him in his future political career but he really wasn't an investigator. Volume four consists of the London testimony held on April 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th with 30 witnesses, including generals Anders, Bohushyszko, and Borkomorowski, as well as Józef Matskiewicz, the Polish journalist who had been among the first witnesses of the exhumation. General, uh, there were also, excuse me, there were also two witnesses who testified under one letter pseudonyms. One of them, Mr. B, was actually Stanislav Svianiewicz, who had been brought to the railroad station from which the victims were driven to their execution, executions and had been held there. He was the one person who got closest to the execution site in Katyn. Um, there was much discussion in this testimony of what Józef Czapski had done and been assigned to do in the Polish investigation, but he did not testify in London. He testified in Germany. What is not mentioned in volume four is the meeting of committee rep representatives with members of the British embassy in Washington well prior to their departure for Britain. They knew the names of the three Britain-based witnesses and asked for them by name. The British Foreign Office decided to play hardball and refused to give the committee members the contact information for these men. As a result, when they met in London, the committee submitted at least one letter addressed to Colonel Frank Stevenson, confirming that they could, get his, could not get his address and had been promised that the letter would be delivered to him. It is my belief that there were two more letters, one addressed to Captain Dr. Stanley Gilder and one to Frank Strubent, and that these men, as British citizens de facto, never received these letters. Stevenson was a South African um, citizen, and that letter was held back for six weeks. By that time, the committee was back in Washington and it could not press for him to be brought to the US from South Africa. The British, since I've announced discovery of uh, these materials, have never addressed the issue of the correspondence concerning these men and the cover letters from the British War Office addressed to the military attache of South Africa. They simply have not acknowledged their existence. Volume five consists of hearings held on April 21st through April 26th in Frankfurt, Germany, with a smaller contingent heading off to Naples, Italy to interview Dr. Palmieri of the International Medical Commission. There was some 20 witnesses heard over those six days, including Joseph Josef Szczapski, who testified about his experience in attempting to locate the missing Polish officers in Russia. There was also the testimony of Dr. Orszos, a Hungarian uh, forensic scientist who insisted that the oath he had taken some 30 years earlier still bound him and he did not need to be sworn in. 
Dr. Transen, who could not disclose the reports that he had smuggled out of Berlin, but was frustrated that the committee was not asking about the rope he had brought out of Katyn and had given to Bliss Lane. However, with greater knowledge of whom he worked for, greater knowledge that we now have based on the Donovan files, this, there is one person who becomes more intriguing, and that is Kempner. Kempner worked for the OSS and was one of the people who had prepared that report. Robert Jackson received the report, but never mentioned it. In his testimony to the Madden Committee, Kempner never mentioned the OSS and simply stated that he worked for Robert Jackson. The name of Donovan or the analysis and memorandum were never mentioned in Kempner's testimony. What remains unclear is whether the committee was aware of this, these documents. The contents of volume six consist of one enormous document received from the Poles in Britain. And it also includes the listing of names of the then known victims who were buried in Kati. Added to this, the various individual documents received in London and Germany, volumes four and five, and there was a significant amount of material to be digested. It is not clear how much of it was read by the individual committee members, nor has anyone ever admitted to serving on the committee in a subsidiary role, except for Puczynski, Mitchell, and the secretary. Uh, there were also stenotypists recording the testimony and type, other typists transcribing it. I should add that some individuals were allowed to review the proofs of their testimony to ensure that their words were not mistranscribed. However, the number of those individuals was very small. But let me revert back by several years as Billis Lane met with Helge Tramsen. Clearly the concept of the Grand Tour has returned as he and his wife had traveled not only to Britain, but traveled to Denmark, then Germany, and then Italy. Um, the rope that Tramson gave to him when they met was brought back to the US where it was subject to testing by a trade association and by the FBI. The FBI conclusions appeared in a memo signed by J. Edgar Coover and conclusively stated that the rope was not of US, British, German, or other known, or French, or other known manufacture. Interestingly, in his testimony, Tramson mentions the issue of the rope and that he gave it, gave it to Bliss Lane. And here we have another case where the committee chooses not to follow up on the lead. Although the committee counsel, John Mitchell, clearly states for the record that the ambassador offered the rope to the committee. And I can assure you that having gone through all the materials that are available of the Madden committee, that rope is nowhere to be found. There is no follow up on this system statement and none of the individuals who have written about this issue in Poland has ever mentioned the curious matter of the ambassador's meetings with prospective witnesses. And that's simply because no one in Poland has ever gone through Bliss Lane's papers. This is just one of the encounters which with Bliss Lane had with various individuals who were closely involved with the Katyn massacre. Uh, Bliss Lane wrote the introduction uh, to uh, Józef Matskiewicz's English, uh, the English language version of Józef Matskiewicz's book, The Katyn Wood Murders, and which Lev Sapieha had translated. The interchange between Ambassador Lane and Congressman Okanski reflects a sardonic sense of humor and is self-deprecatory as well. And I'll quote it to you, it's very short. And your address from Chairman Madden, uh, 2442 Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest Washington. Chairman Madden, what, what is your business? Mr. Lane, I have no business at the present time but I have been, since my resignation as ambassador, engaged as a lecturer and a writer. Mr. Okoinski, you are an unemployed anti-communist. Mr. Lane, that is right, sir. Chairman Madden, proceed, Mr. Council. The committee had returned home, but 
despite 1952 being a campaign year, the members needed to continue working. The next hearings, which would be volume seven, took place on June 3rd and 4th. And then after the summer recess, the primaries and the elections on November 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th, with 29 witnesses. Although during the two earlier hearings, there had been witnesses who testified over two days to complete their testimony. This was the only time when there was a larger number and they testified both in June and November. Former Ambassador Harriman testified, as well as his daughter. There were various members of US agencies and former government officials. There was, there was Stanislav Mikołajczyk, the Polish socialist who had returned to Poland for London, held the post of deputy prime minister, and who escaped from Poland by a ship with the assistance of the US embassy, or presumably the OSS, in October 47. There was even testimony for Harry Hopkins and Admiral Stanley, who had served in Moscow as the ambassador. However, the stars of that testimony, if one can describe them as such, were George Earl, who testified on November 13th and only disclosed that FDR had ordered him sent, as he was in the Naval Reserve, to American Samoa to keep him from being able to speak to reporters about the Katyn massacre. The other person whose testimony took place in June and November and whose questioning took the most time was General Clayton Bissell. He had served in the First World War and was one of the earliest US air pilots. He had served as head of deputy, deputy head of G2 and then the head. He had known of the registered code users. He was aware of the information on Katyn. And he had interviewed Van Vliet upon his return from the West Coast where Japanese bombs carried by hydrogen inflated balloons had dropped on US territory. Finally, there were several executive sessions of which we have no documentary record and would not be aware of except for an oblique mention in the final report, as well as some of the CIA correspondence in memorandums uh, confirming John Mitchell's desire for certain testimony. There are two points that need to be made here. One is that the committee needed to make a point, a big point, and dry documents and even the testimony they had collected did not seem to make it. They needed to find a local party to blame for the fact that the Katyn massacre did not receive the coverage it should have in 1945. The committee truly appears not to have been informed of various things by either military intelligence or the CIA. There may have been some frustration on the part of the Democrats who had lost the presidential election that year, but suddenly General Bissell started to become a fall guy. Clearly with the number of working files missing from the Madden committee records, we cannot tell if there was honest discussion with the army about any documents. What does appear in the records is that Bissell, who was retired by then, was not accompanied by an army attorney as other military officers generally were. Bissell had also written to his military contacts and had asked what was, how were these hearings going to hand, be handled? And he was assured that there was nothing to stress about and he did not specifically need to prepare for the testimony. Van Vliet had returned from Europe carrying photos in a sworn deposition. There is no indication that he ever decided to conceal the existence of the deposition. There is also, uh, it is also entirely credible based on his prior and later actions that he handed over the deposition to Bissell for review. There is nothing about Bissell's actions prior to then or later to indicate that he would destroy the sworn deposition. The fact is that had Bissell swore, destroyed a sworn deposition that might have suddenly as copy number three appeared during the Nuremberg tribunal or trials would have meant that he would face very serious charges and it would have destroyed his career. This all the information that we have at hand leads me to believe that Van Vliet handed the photos and deposition to Bissell. They discussed the general aspects of the report which Van Vliet worked on for the next day and a half. Clearly, by 1951, questions started being publicly asked by Epstein, Montgomery Green at all. The political atmosphere in the US and the world had changed. Korea was exploding and there was fear of what could happen to American servicemen who might be captured. 
The Department of the Army, when approached by Epstein and others, first pulled the incorrect report on the Katyn massacre, and then most probably if they located the Van Vliet report with attachments, realized ah, that they could not release it. General Bissell was retired, and who would think that a missing, re missing report could cause much consternation, but it did. The Army and the other agencies were between the devil and the deep blue sea. If they admitted to holding the report with the attachments, the entire premise of due process and honesty of the Nuremberg trials and tribunal would be destroyed and the Supreme Court Justice Jackson's career would be threatened. I believe they made a decision which they believed was the lesser of two evils and claimed the report had disappeared. This would explain the Army's decision not to aid Bissell in preparation for his testimony and Bissell's complete shock and inability to explain what had happened to the report. The one time in an over three year decade career, a three, over a three decade career, that this man had possibly made an error, if in fact he made it. However, the committee chair realizing that the probability that the goals of the committee would be achieved needed a sacrificial victim. He made special visits to army brass demanding that this will be brought to trial, that he be punished, demoted, have his pension reduced. The army was not willing to process such a demand until finally it simply put a letter into Bissell's file noting that he had not ensured the safety of a document. Bissell simply refused to sign the letter. One should also note that Bissell, as I mentioned earlier, served as military attaché in London. Had the Polish government given serious credence to the allegations, they probably would have demanded that the, he return the Polonia Restituta. The final Madden Committee report. One could state that the Madden Committee failed in its ultimate goal of having the case presented to the UN and then the International Court of World Justice, with the charge being based on having violated the general principles of law of civilized nations. And yet, the committee created a number of landmarks. It held the first congressional hearing on the slaughter of foreign nationals by another nation. It treated the UN as a viable world organization which could and should bring charges forward to an international court. And it used evidence materials which in and of themselves were not conclusive, but as a totality were able to prove Soviet guilt. It would be many years before such cases were brought to the international court, but we have in recent weeks been able to view and be witness to the rulings of the International Court in the case of the Air Malaysia flight, where specific individuals were found guilty. And we are observing the collection of materials by Ukrainian and other forensic teams to document the Russian massacres in Ukraine. The committee, in its final report, consisting of four Democrats and three Republicans, managed to roundly criticize the administration of FDR without mentioning his name as concerned the events of 42, 43, and 44. Congressman Sheehan issued a minority report, which was concurred to by Congressman Okonski, which did not differ much from the main report. It just extended the criticism of G2, the OWI, or Office of War Information, and the Office of Censorship, as well as the Voice of America. To summarize, the Madden Committee seemed to fail in its penultimate goal of bringing the USSR in front of a court of justice. However, it succeeded as a landmark procedure and served and continues to serve both as a warning as to how expeditious agreements in wartime must be carefully structured. I refer here to the London Agreement of 1945. And finally, serves to remind the West, both the US and Western Europe, of the Soviet, now Russian propensity for absolute violence towards both the military and civilian population of occupied territories. I thank you for your attention and patience. Thank you so much. And we, we have a few questions. So let, let me read them out from Thaddeus. I heard that Roman Puczynski, then a newspaper reported, uh, reporter in Chicago, had made a plea to Congress to investigate the Katyn massacre. Is that true? You already mm, said something about Puczynski. Would you like to elaborate about the Puczynski's role? 
um, there were a number of groups which were calling for an investigation uh, that were Polonia groups. Uh, Puczynski's mother was um, a very successful businesswoman. And I honestly believe that given his age and experience, it was she who would have encouraged him to take that position. But it wasn't he who was an instigator of this. As I said before, he was mainly an interpreter and a, and a go for. Um, I think that the statements of Mr. Patsiga and Mr. Pula confirm that as concerns the Madden Committee and the fact that his daughter, who is holding a large amount of Madden Committee related material, including tape recordings in the attic of her house and will not give anybody access to them. I thought I was the one who couldn't get access. No, Pula, Patsiga, they couldn't get access to that material. As they phrased it, she is desperately trying to protect uh, the legacy of her father. I have another question from Basha Yavorska. Is there an available format list of those murdered in Katyn? My grandfather, an educator in Womja, had been arrested by NKVD and perished. My family believes he was executed in Katyn. Uh, the Polish government issued printed versions uh, large blue bound volumes. Uh, there are also online sources where you can find the list of cutting victims. I suggest looking on the webpage of the Polish uh, military cathedral in Warsaw. I believe they have a list or they should have a list. Otherwise, if you do go online, you'll be able to locate it. There are several places. A question from Jerry Ashinsky, actually the one I wanted also to ask. What was the what was Congressman Madden's political motivation for forming the committee? Remember, he didn't really form it. He was appointed to chair it. I have not seen uh, in the Madden committee materials. And as I repeat, they are severely lacking um, in data. I have not found any reference as to uh, how he became engaged in this project. I plan on visiting the archives where his personal papers are held. And so perhaps I'll find some more detailed information there. It could have been simply the fact that he thought it would be a project which would build up his career positively. Uh, and I have a question. It's been 80 years since the Katyn massacre and you, you still are experiencing some issues in accessing certain archives. Could you tell us more and just like give us a picture where you have more problems or less problems? I will say that the United States was very good in releasing the National Archives materials in 2012. That, is, that was a huge database of information. Um, clearly, I've been waiting for three years now, literally November of 2019, for the CIA to release uh, the materials on Mitchell and on Tonietsk, or Tonietsky. They are in process, as Professor Mark Kramer of uh, Harvard uh, University Annals of Communism said to me, be glad that they haven't told you that they don't have anything. At least it means they're working on something and they're considering releasing it to you. However, uh, who is impossible and absolutely dreadful, and I can't understand why the Polish government hasn't approached them, is the British government they still are not releasing materials. I refer specifically uh, to what, uh, what existed for every POW, what are called exit interviews. Every POW who returned home underwent an exit interview. I contacted Hanslow Park, which is an immense 
archive of uh, classified data, which was unknown to the British world until around 2015. And when I learned that it existed, I wrote to them trying to get materials on Stevenson, Strubent, and Dr. Gilder. It was back and forth for nine months. Oh, you're asking for a too long a period. Oh, you're this, oh, you're that. Finally, after nine months, they sent me a response with three photographs. They confirmed that they had files for each of the three men, but that the files were empty. And they sent me photographs of empty folders. And um, I can say that I really didn't believe uh, that they were empty. And I say that because in 2012, when my book was published and the correspondence between Frank, uh, the Madden Committee addressed to Frank Stevenson, then the correspondence from the British War Department to South Africa House of Military Attaché, and finally the Mili South Africa Military House, uh, Africa House M Military Attaché uh, writing to Frank uh, Strubent was discovered and published. The British never acknowledged the report that, that was included in that folder the correspondence, the letter from the Madden Commission. It's, it's as though, you know, I were a crazy woman who had walked out into the middle of the Pacific and announced this. In fact, the British were invited to the book opening, um, the, the book promotion at the Museum of the Polish Army, as were the South Africans and the Germans and the Americans. The Germans showed up. The Americans showed up, the South Africans showed up. Not only did the British not show up, they didn't even send a letter saying, oh, sorry, we can't be there, but could you forward us a copy of the book? So I still see the British as being totally stonewalling the issue. Okay, thank you. I have two more questions as, as they keep coming. Uh, Mary, Mary. Can you comment on the radio announcer, I believe, in Buffalo, who was silenced about talking about the massacre? That was part of the Office of War Information and the Office of uh, Censorship. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, there was a meeting in New York City. Um, it was at a period of time when there License to broadcast was under consideration, if that is the same individual, and this was sort of used to intimidate him. However, every single foreign language broadcaster was subject to OWI interference, and specifically in the case of the Katyn massacre, it was even more intense than in other cases. Okay, a uh, question from Richard Federovich. Why did Roosevelt not receive more criticism for his role in covering up the massacre? Because Roosevelt was the great president, quote unquote, who had brought the United States out of the Great Depression because he had, uh, through his decision-making process, saved the United States in the Pacific and in Europe, uh, stopped the Japanese and helped the British be saved. Uh, it was very difficult to criticize and condemn this man who was seen as a total hero. I see Roosevelt as um, using the same sort of mentality that General Tukhachevsky had when he spoke about Ukrainian and Belarusian uh, individuals, males who were sent to the front without weaponry. Every bullet that goes into one of them is one less bullet available to go into one of my men. As long as the Russians were dealing with the Germans on the Eastern Front, the US could get prepared to, to 
really be mechanically, i.e. tanks, guns, and so on, prepared for war and to supply the allies that they had with that equipment. And also the U.S. Army could be brought up to snuff because the U.S. Army really wasn't, brought, wasn't ready. When Van Vliet and Stewart were taken prisoner in February of 43 uh, in the ba Battle of Kazarin Pass in Tunisia, it was a total debacle. 1,400 men were taken prisoner of war. They just the com thing completely fell apart because the general did not know how to plan the battle. Um, another question is, I think, for an attorney, or a legal expert from Mark Dillon. Is there any possibility for the descendants of the victims of the cutting to file a class action wrongful death war crimes lawsuit against the Russian Federation as, a, as the successor regime to the Soviets in International Court of Justice in the Hague or other legal venue to seek reparations? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, there was an attempt by uh, Polish families to file that sort of a suit, and it was declared that this was not a crime uh, again. This was not a genocidal crime against humanity. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. I think my opinion is pretty clear. Okay, a question from jo jo Joanna Dankiewicz Schneider. What, in your opinion, has been the impact of the Madden's report on the overall propagation of the Karen massacre knowledge in the contemporary world? Are you referring, the question I would have to ask is, are you referring to the report proper, the 60 odd pages? Or you're, are you referring to the entirety of the testimony? There are very few people who have really read the entire testimony and have done the back and forth of researching various individuals and how they relate and what other things they've written. Um, it's what I started with the sentence that I started with when I began speaking that people really don't know anything about the Katyn massacre. They just know the generalities. There are representatives of Polonia who speak about the 22,000 people killed in the Katyn forest, which reflects a total lack of knowledge about the massacre. And yet this is supposedly one of the major war crimes that Polish nationals in Poland and the Polish diaspora cares about. But people only know 2% and claim to understand it. Not sure if I've answered that question really. Okay, another question from Susan Okonski. Could British reluctance to release information be due to an attempt to protect the legacy of Winston Churchill's? I, 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 I don't think so. I think based on what I've read, and again, I may be totally wrong, Winston Churchill and Great Britain were really dependent on the United States for their war equipment. Without that equipment, they could not do anything. If FDR was going to say that the sky was, I don't know, purple green, Churchill wouldn't have contested that. Keep the man happy, keep him sending weapons, keep him sending his boys. Okay, another question from Rebecca Schiller. Actually, there are those uh, who say that FDR helped to prolong the depression. I think it's more a comment than a question. Would you like to, to make your comments on that? I wouldn't touch that issue. Okay, so let's skip it. And let me conclude with a comment from Ann Petelka Pickard. My mother, Zofia 
Korpovska Petelka told me about cutting when I was a very young child. How is it possible that a woman who survives World War II, including the Warsaw Uprising, knows the truth, but the British, etc., deny it? Isn't now, when Russia is guilty of war crimes in Ukraine, the time to go public with Katyn again as a reminder of what Russia is, did, and is still doing? I would say the following. In the United States, it was Marcy Kaptur from Ohio, who was very active in getting the president to state that NARA should declassify these materials. I don't know if the Polish community, the Polish diaspora in Great Britain has an elected official who is willing to press on their government to do that. Given the turmoil in the British government in the last months, I think that that's probably way down low on their list of priorities. Notwithstanding that, I would think that right now is an appropriate moment for the ambassador in London to submit a letter to the British government asking that the foreign office, that the archives, that Hanslope Park, that all of these locations release everything that they have to do a second scrub through. However, given the fact that, what was it, five years ago, four years ago, they announced that they were not gonna release all the documents that they have on the crash of the Shikorsky plane off the coast of Gibraltar, I'm not sure that there would be much success. Okay, so whatever questions you have, please send directly either to Ms. Pirkowska or you can send to us. We have to conclude the session. Ms. Pirkowska, thank you so much for a very interesting lecture I presentation. Uh, on the Katyn massacre on the Madden's report. And let me encourage the, uh, all participants to join the Kosciuszko Foundation to support us so we can continue with an interesting webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you.